Hi, everyone, and welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online for December 13th. We are so happy you joined us today. I hope you have or will, depending on when you watch this, join us for our churchwide time of prayer at 9.30 each Sunday morning as we unite in prayer, even while we're apart. If you need a prayer guide, we have it on the website, and you can just download that there. And today at 11 a.m. is our annual congregational meeting to vote on the budget for next year, so keep that in your prayers. And I want to thank you again for your faithful support for the church this whole year. You've been amazing, and we are so grateful for that. This coming Wednesday is our special night out Christmas event, and so pray for good weather for that. Uh, we, we just uh, w really want to make it a great night for our special friends. And next Sunday, we'll be having our candlelight service at 6 p.m. And if you're able to get out, we encourage you to join us for that. It's going to be a great night of music and worship as we begin our celebration of Christmas week. And then the following Sunday, December 27th, our new senior minister, Steve, is going to be here to preach while I'm on vacation. Now, just to let you know, he won't be on video that week for several reasons, but for one, I'm going to have to record that early so I can have it posted before I leave town. But uh, we will have our online service that day, so just want to let you know of that. Uh, and on New Year's Eve, December 31st, we're going to have a 12-hour prayer vigil as we start the new year. I don't think there's been a year in a long time that needs our prayer as it begins as much as this one does. We're going to kick it off with a prayer service at noon in the auditorium, and we'll be dividing the next 11 and a half hours into half-hour slots and asking folks to sign up to pray. The church building will be open that afternoon if you'd like to pray here, but we don't care where you are when you pray, just that you pray. So I'm going to post a sign-up sheet online this week, and we encourage you to join us as we begin 2021. And beginning January 5th, We'll be having a ladies' Bible study on Tuesdays at 5.30 p.m. It's going to run for six weeks. And the topic is forgiving what you can't forget. Discover how to move on and make peace with painful memories and create a life that's beautiful again. So if you haven't signed up for that already, ladies, just call the office, email me, and I'll get you signed up. Well, as we come to our prayer time this week, I want to remind you that in our Sunday news, we put the bulletin each week. Uh, that we put in the bulletin. We, we put the additions to the prayer list at the top, and we have those names we're still praying for but aren't new to the list below that. And I'm including the Sunday news on the website now, so you can download that and have the full prayer list there. And so just because we don't mention the full list each week, you can have that there and know that we're still praying. And when we get updates, we try to send those out via email. So if you aren't signed up for those updates, just call the office or email me and I'll add you to the list. We want to continue to remember Steve as he searches for a house here in Charlottesville. Uh, we also want to remember Phil T's family as his grandmother passed away this past week. And we want to lift them up to the Lord in prayer. Phil was our piano player for a long time and he's still part of the family. Uh, Ruby A. asked us to pray for Jeanette P. and her son who have COVID. And Linda B. asked us to add her friend, Andrea F., who has been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, Johnny P. is going to have back surgery on December 30th, and so we want to be in prayer for him as he goes through that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, you blessed us in so many ways, and we are so grateful. You blessed our church throughout this pandemic, and we thank you for that. Lord, we want to ask your blessing on Phil's family as they're going through this loss right now. We pray that they'll find peace and comfort at this time. And Father, with the names we've mentioned of those who are sick, we just ask that you would bless them according to your will. And we pray that you would continue to work in Steve's housing situation. We pray that you would do what you know is best in your timing and that we'd be able to have him here with us when it's right. And Lord, we thank you for caring about our needs at all times. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we started our new series called The Greatest Gift. And after a time of worship, we'll have part two, It Doesn't Add Up. I once was lost, 
Last week we talked about the fact that it's hard to believe that everybody wouldn't want Christmas to be true. Maybe not the version people see, maybe not what some people have experienced with Christians who don't act very Christ-like, but as scripture presents it, as, as you would look at the life of Jesus and what he taught and how he lived, it's hard to believe anyone wouldn't want it to be true. Because people in scripture, all kinds of people, religious, irreligious, Jews and Gentiles, they were all drawn to Jesus. So logically, if we get this right, people should find Christianity attractive today. People who are nothing like Jesus liked him. And Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. And the reason people were drawn to him is grace. Now, we talked last week about how grace is undeserved. It's unearned favor from God. It's favor that's given not because of anything you've done, but actually in spite of what you've done. We talked about how we crave it, even though we don't think about it that way. When we've done something wrong, we crave it. We want people to see us as if it never happened. We want the relationship to be restored in spite of what we've done. It's undeserved, unearned favor. But the thing about grace is that until you've experienced it, it's just a concept to you. Grace requires a relationship. Without a relationship, there's no transfer of grace. There's no experience of grace. That's why God had to come to earth, so that we could have a relationship. Because without a relationship, 
we can't experience grace. And that's why John, writing his gospel as an old man, tells his story. And at the beginning of his gospel, he gives kind of a Christian creation account. Uh, it even starts like the account of the creation in Genesis 1.1. It starts out in John 1.1 saying, In the beginning was the Word. Instead of saying Jesus, he uses the Greek term logos, which referred to the wisdom and action of God in human form. It's the mind of God and his ability to act here in human form. And he says in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And there was probably a scribe writing this down for John. And he probably asked, well, how did that work? How did God take on a human body? And John's going, I don't know how to explain it any more than that. All that I know is after my time with Jesus, I know that Jesus was God somehow becoming flesh and living among us. And he says, and we, meaning the disciples, have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was all grace and all truth all the time. But it was the grace that was so unsettling to people. For instance, one day Jesus was passing through Jericho, not planning to stay, and there was a man there named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, really rich guy. Now, if you've been in church forever, you know this story. Luke's gospel tells the story in chapter 19, and John is right there in the middle of it. Zacchaeus is really rich because he's a chief tax collector, and he had a lot of other tax collectors under him. And they were all charging people more than the Romans had set as the tax, and they were pocketing the difference. And all the guys under Zacchaeus were kicking up his cut of what they were taking. It's kind of like a mob boss. When the guys under him stole stuff, they'd send him his tribute so that he could wet his beak a little. So Zacchaeus was a really rich guy. But the people in the community hated him because he was a fellow Jew working for the Romans and stealing from his countrymen. He was considered a traitor as well as a thief. But for some reason, he wanted to see Jesus. He had probably heard stories about him. He had probably heard about the healings Jesus had performed and things like that. But there was such a crowd he couldn't see because he was short. And he really didn't want to meet Jesus probably because he would have figured he'd know what Jesus would say to him. But he was curious. He wanted to see. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree, which is awkward for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, he's a grown man, not a kid. And secondly, the robes they wore back then would have made that really awkward. But he must really have been curious about Jesus because he managed to see where the parade was headed. He got ahead of it and he scrambled up the tree. By the way, how many of you remember the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he? You remember that from Sunday school? Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it, I promise. I don't know if the guy who wrote that song was Irish because we'd never word it that way today. I remember when Alameda Zacchaeus, who was also fairly short, uh, played for UVA. And I remember watching a game where he broke free and just blew past the defense for a touchdown. And one of the announcers on TV said, Zacchaeus is a wee little man. <laughs> And I thought, well, there's somebody who went to Sunday school as a kid. Uh, probably only about a quarter of the people watching that got that reference that day. But I did, and I thought it was pretty cool. So Zacchaeus is up in the tree, and Jesus comes toward him, and he gets to the tree, and he stops. And he looks up in the tree, and he says, what? Zacchaeus, you come down. Yeah, I, I don't think he shook his finger at him the way we did in the song as kids. But it makes for a good motion to the song. And this is what I think happened. Scripture doesn't say this, but I think a hush falls over the crowd like at a basketball game when the guy, the guy from the home team goes to the free throw line and it's so loud and then all of a sudden you could hear a pin drop. I think the crowd was excited thinking finally someone's got the guts to stand up to this guy and he's finally going to get what he deserves. And I think they made way for him. I think they parted so that he could get to Jesus and then closed in around him so he couldn't duck out. And this had to be an awkward moment for Zacchaeus. I mean, he really wasn't looking for this much attention. He just wanted to see the guy who was creating such a stir. And now he calls him down and he wants to talk to him. And now the entire town is watching this grown man climb down from a tree. 
that's awkward. And I picture like the old Westerns and the two guys meeting on the street with the crowd watching. And I imagine all kinds of possibilities were running through his head about what was going to happen. I mean, Jesus had this little gang of 12 guys with him and Zacchaeus knew the crowd liked Jesus and hated him. So this was an incredibly nerve wracking moment for Zacchaeus. And he climbs down and he makes his way through the crowd, through the opening that they created. He makes his way to Jesus and he kind of feels him close in around him. And now he's standing in front of Jesus. And Jesus shocks the crowd by saying, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. And the disciples are thinking, oh, come on. Can't we just keep going? I mean, we got places to go. You don't want to stop for lunch at a tax collector's house. I think all the disciples were thinking that except one, Matthew. Because I think Matthew looked at Zacchaeus and saw himself. Because at one time, he was the hated tax collector. And Jesus took time to sit down with him and his tax collector friends and eat a meal. And Jesus asked Matthew to follow him. So I think Matthew probably saw this whole situation differently from the other disciples. But they didn't want to go to Zacchaeus' house any more than they had wanted to go to Matthew's house when Jesus invited Matthew to follow him. And the crowd surrounding them as they stood there on the street, the crowd that had probably been hoping that Jesus was going to light into Zacchaeus and give him what for and humiliate him there in public, they began to mutter, which is a great word, by the way, we don't use enough anymore. We need to bring that word back because it's kind of disgusted grumbling and complaining all in one. It's not really loud enough for, anyone, for everyone to understand, but they hear the tone. That's a lot to pack into a word. We need to use the word mutter more. Well, they started muttering. He's going to whose house? I mean, we camped out all night to be in the right spot to see him and to talk with him. And he's going to go to a tax collector's house? Was he cozying up to rich people now? It was like college game day when they came to JPJ, you know? We got up early. We made the signs. We were excited so we could get on camera. And now they're going to let someone else in? One side of the street was cheering, we love Jesus, yes we do, we love Jesus, how about you? All excited. And the other side of the street answered, we're the ones who sang the songs, we're the ones who had the t-shirts made, we're Jesus fans, and he chooses to go to the house of this guy who's basically a traitor to his people, a thief who's ripped off everybody in this town, either directly or indirectly, by taking a kickback from the ones who did. What's up with that? It's so upside down and backward from what everyone was expecting. And it's still that way compared to the way we look at things today. And I think that those of us who grew up, grew up in church hearing this story all the time and singing the song a zillion times, I think we lose sight of just how shocking and wrong this seemed to the people who witnessed it. And they didn't understand it. And we have trouble understanding just how the kingdom of God works the way God sees the world, and the way he sees us. And so over and over, Jesus would use parables to try to explain this upside-down kingdom that he's come to build and this strange concept of grace. And I'm in front of another crowd, or when Jesus was in front of another crowd, he said, let me try to explain it to you this way. The kingdom of heaven is light, which meant that he was about to tell a fictitious story that had a true point to it. And people who followed Jesus knew that when he told one of these parables, there were a couple things to look for. One thing to look for was the God figure in the story, and the other was the you figure. Somewhere in most of Jesus' parables, there was someone or something that represents God and someone or something that represents you. And so in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus said this. He said, let me try to explain to you what the kingdom of God is like that I'm inviting you to be a part of. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, a rich guy who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. So he goes to the public square because that's where the guys looking for work are hanging out. And, and <clears throat> usually you'd pick all the guys you would need for the day at one time. And a landowner's primary concern is getting the job done. So he says, look, okay, I'll pay you a denarius, a typical day's wages, if you go and work in my vineyard today. So you, 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 and you, all of you go and head over to my vineyard and report to the foreman. Well, about three hours later, about nine o'clock in the morning, 
He goes back and he sees several more men there in the public square hoping to find work. So he looks at them and says, look, I, I still need more help. I, I don't have enough guys. You guys all go to my vineyard, work for the day, and I'll pay you what's right. We'll work it out at the end of the day. And, and even if you haven't heard this parable before, you probably know where this is headed, right? And, and it's hard because to our ears, it seems so unfair. But it's going to introduce the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. So the vineyard owner in the parable goes back out to the town square around lunchtime and he sees some other guy standing around and he says, hey, come work for me in my vineyard. I, I've got a lot of work to do and I still don't have enough guys yet. And then he goes back about three in the afternoon and he sees more guys there and he says the same thing to them. And one of the things about Jesus' stories is that Jesus often would take things to the extreme which had people, you know, leaning in to see where this was all going to go. And that's where Jesus takes this story. He says that at five in the afternoon, right? At five in the afternoon, there's only about an hour of daylight left at this point. He goes out to the marketplace again. He sees others standing around and he asks why they aren't working. And they say, well, nobody hired us today. And then he says to them, at 5 p.m., you go and work in my vineyard. And the crowd's thinking, how is he going to sort all this out? How's he going to know who started work when? They didn't have a time clock. There, there wasn't a human resources department. This was a first century vineyard. You know, they're out in the fields all day. How is the vineyard owner going to know how to sort out who gets what pay? Because you had some guys who had been there since six in the morning. And Jesus says, then evening came. And Matthew's gospel tells us in chapter 20, verse 8, it says this. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. So start with the people who basically have only been there an hour. And, and, and really, to be honest, by the time they got to the vineyard and got their instructions, it was probably only a half an hour to 45 minutes of ex actual work they did. And here's the twist of the story, and here's the point that Jesus is trying to make about the kingdom of God. He's saying, this is what it's like in God's kingdom. And if you don't know how this parable ends, it's unsettling to some people. And to other people, it's really hopeful. Honestly, it's unsettling to people like me. The ones who got there early and have been working all day. The ones who camped out for, for the parade and, and made signs and got t-shirts made. You know, I got there at 5.30 a.m. even though I knew that I wouldn't get hired until 6.00. And I even offered to stay late. I, I, I'm the one who missed the wonderful world of Disney every Sunday night as a kid because I was at church. And then they had to listen to all my friends the next day at school talk about what a cool thing I had missed. But I'm not bitter. I was there every time the doors were open. And we were the first ones there and the last ones to leave. I mean, I'm far from perfect, but I've been trying to walk the straight and narrow all my life. I was the one behaving myself when my friends were out partying. That's, that's my point of view on this story. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And the story goes on in verse 9. The workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. They got what the original group was promised. And everyone in line behind them started getting excited. They were thinking, wow, if he gave them a denarius for just an hour, imagine how much we're going to get since we've been here so much longer. So when those who were hired first came up to the paymaster... They were expecting to receive more, but each of them got one denarius. And what did they do when they received exactly what they had agreed to? They didn't just mutter. They grumbled out loud against the vineyard owner, just like the religious leaders we talked about last week outside of Matthew's house, just like the people in line at Jericho who got there early and saw Jesus go home with that tax collector, Zacchaeus. And the vineyard workers, they complained to the man who hired them. What's this all about? We, we worked all day in the hot sun, and they only worked an hour or less. We did far more than they did. How come they got the same pay we did? Verse 13 says this. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. To which everyone in Jesus' audience, because they could identify with the all-day guys, thought, what? That's not fair. How is that fair? And the vineyard owner said, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. 
And then Jesus, through the voice of the vineyard owner, tells us about what it means to be part of God's kingdom. He said, I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Wait, gave? You didn't give us anything. We earned it. We worked for it. And the vineyard owner says, don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? And here's the clincher. This is the convicting part. This is the moment where if someone hadn't figured out who he was in the parable, he knows now. And in this next statement, Jesus puts the spotlight on how absurd it is to resist either extending or receiving grace. It's where Jesus puts the spotlight on my hypocrisy when it comes to grace. Jesus says through the voice of the vineyard owner, are you envious because I'm generous? Are you resentful because I'm generous? Wait, 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 hang on. Envious of generosity? Resentful of generosity? Who would be that way? That's childish. I'm not resentful of your generosity. I just think that since I worked harder, oh, so you're not resentful because of my generosity, are you? And Jesus kind of outs all of us who are the 6 a.m. workers, right? That's the way we see things, isn't it? But Jesus wants us to see the world differently. He wants us to see our relationship with God differently because the kingdom of God is characterized by a shocking amount of generosity. And he's kind of asking us, are you okay with that? Are you okay with people getting far more than they deserve? Would you be willing to offer others what they don't deserve? Can you handle that? Because my heavenly father has offered you exactly what you don't deserve. And of course, at this point, all the, all the 5 p.m. workers are going, yeah, woohoo!" And all the prodigal sons and daughters say, all right. And all the guys who destroyed their families and thought God would never listen to another prayer of theirs again say, absolutely. And the prodigal wives and mothers who skipped out on their responsibility and then woke up several years later thinking God would never forgive them, they say, all right, this is great. This is wonderful. But what about the people like me? What about those of you who are the early to the parade people, the 6 a.m. workers? Well, Jesus pulls out of the parable and he says to people like me, people like you, he says, look, when you really start to understand what God's kingdom is like, when you really get it, when you really embrace it every single day of your life, it may feel like the first are actually last and the last are actually first. And it's going to feel unfair because of how you were taught to measure fairness. And how do we measure fairness? We compare. And when we compare to others, we're going to think that God is unfair. And Jesus says, the thing is, you're comparing to each other, but you're comparing yourself to the wrong standard. The real standard is me. You're to compare yourselves to me and not others. When you do that, none of you measure up. And I gave you grace too. And if you're trying to figure out grace by doing the math, you're going to have real trouble because it just didn't add up. The math of grace doesn't add up, but it's always in our favor. I wasn't a math major. I was a history major in college and a theology major in seminary. I wasn't a mathematician, but I can do basic math. Now, I almost forgot it once I hit algebra. I hit algebra in high school, and I took a test once in pre-calculus, and it, it was one of those tests with a two-page question and a four-page answer, and I did all the calculus for four pages and got down to the end to three times two, and I put five. Did all the calculus right, three times two, five. But I got all that sorted out. I wasn't a math major, but I know that two plus three plus six plus nine plus five doesn't equal zero. When you add up all the sins you've committed, it comes out to a number with a lot of zeros, not one. But when Christ is factored in, the number is zero. It doesn't make sense, but that's the math of grace. Six lies, plus two times drunk, plus 50 lost tempers, plus one abortion, plus nine times cheating on tests, plus two affairs, plus 500 accounts of gossip, plus seven expense fudges, plus Jesus equals zero. It doesn't add up, but that's what grace is. Everyone's invited. The people who show up at 6 a.m., noon, or 5.59 p.m. People with baggage, people with regret, people with a past, along with, and here's the kicker, along with the people who judge those with baggage and past and a regret. 
Everyone. Everyone is crucial to the kingdom of God. Isn't that great? And Jesus calls everyone. The one who was all grace and all truth all the time. The one who called sin, sin, and sinner, sinners, and then went and laid down his life for the sin of the sinners like you and me. We all come to the kingdom the same way, by repenting, giving him control of our life, and being baptized into him. And it doesn't make sense. Grace doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. But the best math in the world is the math that doesn't add up. When you think about the Christmas story, there's nothing that adds up from a human perspective. That God would care enough about us after we sinned against him so much that he'd step down from heaven and become human like us. And that God in human form would be born as, you know, as a peasant to a peasant girl and a carpenter she's pledged to be married to. That he'd be born in a corral and placed in a feeding trough because there was no room for them anywhere else. All that's amazing enough. But to think that he did it in order to eventually sacrifice himself for us on the cross and take the punishment that we deserve for our sin, it doesn't add up because we didn't deserve it. In fact, we deserve just the opposite, but that's what grace is. It's a one-sided act of love. And Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross was the pinnacle of grace. And the bread and the cup that, rem that remind us of his body and blood remind us of the grace we didn't deserve and received anyway. Scripture says, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. It goes on in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take of the cup together. Let's pray. Well, we know when we look at what Jesus did for us, that it just doesn't add up because we deserve just the opposite of what he did for us. But Lord, we are grateful. And we ask that you would help us to take that grace that he extended to us and share it with those around us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wanna thank you for joining us today. And if you ever wanna talk about a decision for Christ, please let me know. Email me, call the office, and I'll be glad to sit down and talk with you about that anytime at all. I hope you have a great week and look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless.